Welcome to part three of my interview with Al Capone. In this segment, we give advice for people starting in the business. We talk about when we first met, we go for a car ride, and we talk about some of the work we've done. Enjoy. What advice would you have given yourself, you know, years ago? You got to know when to follow the, your gut path that you're, that, that's leading you in that direction. And you got to know when you're getting sound advice that can help you. That's that's hard advice because when you're young, it's kind of hard to to know the difference. I promise you, that's something I would have told myself. I would tell my young self, "You actually on the right path. You just don't think you're on. You know, on some levels, you know you're on the right path because you're doing what you are uh, setting out to do. You just you you know that you're young and you're kind of questioning certain things because you you think you don't fully know everything. So you want to look to some other people that you think know better, but you don't know where their mind or heart is about what they telling you. Cause they could be telling you something that's, uh, cause they trying to benefit themselves. Well, sometimes people are giving you advice that might even have your best interest at heart, but their experiences are a little different than what you're going through and where you're at. So they might give you advice and it might've been good for them. doesn't mean it's good for you. But a lot of times people are giving you advice, but they actually have this other agenda or managers. Managers are supposed to be looking out for your best interest, but it, actually they have another agenda that is more about their agenda with their career than your agenda and your fucking career as an artist. And that's, that's something to look out for. You got to be real careful about other people's agendas. Yeah. It's certain things you can't explain at the time, but it's a feeling you get yeah. that you can't explain and you know like something ain't right about that. That little feeling of something ain't right about that is really right telling you you probably don't need to listen to that person or take some time to think about it. And if it still bothers you, you better listen to yourself. I noticed a lot of major brands and corporations, they know what their brand is. Yeah. They have these core points about their brand that if anything, anybody that wants to partner, do a partnership with them or wants them, you know, want them to go whatever direction, if it doesn't align with that, though, the core, it automatically, automatically lets them know that's not the right direction to go. You're talking about like core beliefs. Mm -hmm. You'll you'll see that with big corporations, but also their mission statement. Mm -hmm. I feel like people should write a mission statement of sorts down when they're young in their career. I mm -hmm. think it's important to write down when you're getting started what it is you hope to accomplish, mm -hmm. how you want to accomplish it. And also write down a list of the people that are helping you now, mm -hmm. before you got money, before you're famous. Mm -hmm. When success does come, you need something you can look back on that reminds you. Yep. Because, dude, when things start taking off, trust me, it's easy to forget that stuff when you're surrounded by people that are sharks, mm -hmm. but they're going to seem like your best friends. Yep. And they're going to convince you that all the, some of those people that were helping you are no longer good for you because the they're way. trying to get them out of the fucking way. You need that goddamn list of paper there because you'll start to believing these fucking evil fucks. So you need that list to remind yourself, oh, wait, you know, Bob was there or whoever, you know, when it was helping me it was out. nothing and going on. Those are the people. They might not be the most skilled people in the industry, but they got your back and yeah. you can trust them. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's good to keep those people around. Would you deviate from that? you destroy the core of what draw people to you in the first place. And now when you lose that, you lose your core people. And once your core people are gone, the farewell of people will eventually disappear because yep. they're like, oh, what happened to all the excitement? And then they're gone. Then they're, they're gone. gone. And now you are like, what the hell happened? Yeah. Oh, I've seen it. <laughs> I remember meeting you and I'd heard about you, but it's not what I expected. Like normally when you meet a rap guy, especially with a name, they're like super cool. Like, yo, man, what's good? But I remember you kind of came out and you're almost like, you're like, hey, man, you know, how are you doing? And you're like, we chop you like, you're like, yeah. And then, and then you're like, hey, I got to go. Because you're like talking to everybody. So, you you know, like you were the man of the hour. And I was like, oh, I really, I like this guy. I remember that, man. So, I, and um, the first time uh, when I came to the studio, my studio in Atlanta. In Atlanta. My set of Atlanta studios was when I was going to the studio with E-40 and Lil Jon at Big Boy Stank Only Your Studio. Yeah, so that's, I mean. Yeah. I, and I knew you worked with Lil Jon and uh, Bone Crusher. He didn't and, uh, tell you my studio was in a house? 
He did not tell me. Oh that. my god. Okay. So so that's the first <laughs> shock. I'm like, okay, uh, hold on. I'm in a neighborhood. So I pull up some more. Oh I'm like, hold on. Uh, is that that? But it's all these trees and it, it's almost it, it's. I thought I was in a Jason movie, but to be honest with you. Yeah, well, so so that, you know, just so everybody knows, my studio, the zone that I've had for years at Out Came 2, it is in a house. There's a driveway that comes down around back. I've let all the trees grow. It's a scary looking house intentionally. And that and makes on, sense. And on the back wall. Hold up, hold up. Let me okay. tell the back wall okay. story. Go ahead. So, okay, I'm already creeped out a little bit because, you know, I'm, I'm, got my, I'm making sure my pistol is close by. <laughs> Like man, I'm just I don't I don't want no problems, but if something pop out of nowhere, I'm shooting. And I think you said, come on down the driveway. Okay, all right, I'm come down the driveway. My thought was, let me bag down the driveway so I can be able to pull out if I need to. <laughs> Finally get down the driveway. I'm like, what in the hell? I I was about to call, call Mike, like, what the f- the hell is going on, dude? So I finally get out the car, go to the door. I see all of these these ornaments that look like voodoo heads and all over the walls. I'm, before you even go in the studio, I'm like, man, they're trying to kill me. <laughs> They're trying to kill me. I've been set up for a murder. <laughs> so you, But when you open the door, your energy was completely different from everything I just experienced. It was like, you were just like, hey, how you doing? I'm like... Okay, I think it's gonna be all right. <laughs> so that was my first, you know, uh, uh, actually coming to the studio with you. That that whole vibe and experience were like, well, n- 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 no other studio. I never had the experience. Well, from my anywhere. point of view, I remember I could hear the engine out back, mm-hmm. and I thought, oh, he's here. And I looked through the little people and said, okay, he's there. So I walked back in the control and like sat down, like you know, he's gonna turn off the car and come in. But it was a long time. I thought he's still out there, and the truck was still on and. I thought, okay, maybe he's on a conversation, but it went on for a long fucking time. You're out there freaking out. <laughs> Finally, you came in and you were really quiet. <laughs> and I said, okay, you know. And then we started working. And then I think it was like after two hours and you warmed up, you're like, hey, man, I just got to tell you, it's scary here. Like, I was scared. <laughs> and you tell me the story because the back, the back of my studio there, I've got like a, a green man. I'm sure some people know what the green man is. That's a protective thing, but some of that is definitely like voodoo heads and shit. I am trying to scare oh, people. Hey, that's, some I'm of talking it's about for, all over the world, dude. Yeah, I, I mean, I like that kind of stuff. I mean, I like gargoyles and stuff like that. I mean, you know, and I go thank like you, my, gargoyles and all that I, stuff. I, I literally will go to a graveyard at midnight on a full moon just because I dig shit like that. I'm weird like that, so but it's you, kind of my vibe. The, 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 yeah. So, you know, the yeah. other thing was interesting. You came in and we started working on music. I just went Whoa, on the bass. I just went, Whoa. I made this weird sound. You're like, what's that? <laughs> and that was the thing. I think we built a whole song out of me just going like, Whoa. and that was kind of the start. And I was like, well, that's kind of cool. Instead of like these structured planned things, that was when I was like, okay, I like this guy. He's yeah. like, he's listening for the thing that happens in between the other things that everybody thinks you're supposed to do. Yeah. And that's where the real magic yep. is. And it's like, okay, he yep. caught that. Yeah, not that I was planning it, but it just kind of happened and you caught it and I didn't even catch mm-hmm. it. So I thought that was kind of cool. And mm-hmm. that, that kind of, to me, kind of set everything in motion. Yeah. I tried, it. Like, I tried it and now I know, but I always learned something really good along the way. Well, you just said something that, um, that it's, it's kind of the, one of the models I kind of live by is, is I don't ever want to regret one day not doing or trying something that even if I don't know for sure about it or if I, I'm not uh, ex- expert in it or whatever the case may be, I want to at least try. And like you said, you, yeah. I'm, I'm all right with failing, uh, but I, I want to at least try. And and it's an experience in, in trying and failing as well. I mean, you can learn things in that experience. And I can, I just know I don't, it helps me to, to go for things that I probably wouldn't normally go for because my in the back of my mind, I'm always saying, are you going to regret not doing that one day? Are you going to, 10 years from now, are you going to say, damn, I should have tried it? Uh, right. I know what you're Okay. I should have tried it, but I didn't try it because I didn't think I had enough skill or I didn't, I didn't understand it enough or I didn't know the right people, so I just didn't try it. I, but I could have did something. 
and yeah. I didn't do that something to even find out if I could do it. I think you just kind of hit the nail on the head for me. Like the word regrets in a weird way. There's like all these things you go through in life that can haunt you. But for me, the biggest one is, and I mean, trust me, I've, I've done a lot of stupid shit that, I, that bothers me. But the thing that actually bothers, this is a crazy intersection here. It is. The thing that bothers me the most is having regrets. Yes. And I had so many regrets when I was younger that I decided I'm gonna live my life in such a way that I have less and less regrets. So when I'm older, the amount of regrets is like, you know, the proportion of it is overcome by... I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. I'm going. Yeah, the proportion... <laughs> oh, and then take a right right here. Right. The proportion of regrets are lower later. I yep. just hate having regrets. Yeah. Regrets yep. on things I didn't do exactly. is the main thing. Like regretting I didn't try something. Or, try it, at least God, try God, that's it. the biggest thing. And I just don't ever want to... I just... I hate that. I'm with I you 100%. That. That's, that's, that's my driving force when I'm making any... Like serious decision, it always comes down to: Are you gonna regret not doing this one day? Yeah. And if 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 my thought is yes, I am, then fucking I'm doing it. I don't give give a damn how it's gonna get done. I don't exactly. know. I have no clue, but I'm doing it. I'm going whatever that step one is. That's the only step I know. I don't know what's after that. I'm taking that step. And normally. You know, uh, like you said, whether whether I succeed in this, uh, uh, whatever that step is, or if I fail in it, I know at least I don't have the regret. I win because I don't regret it. At the end of the day, that's how I look at it. Is there a particular parking spot you're looking for? Well, I, I, I'm talking and <laughs> driving. <laughs> I'm, I'm notorious for talking and just driving. And <laughs> I've never actually driven in a car with you before. Uh, think about just, it. As I'm looking, I'm talking, driving, and I'm looking at spots I could have parked. Do you have any regrets parked. about parking spots you didn't take? No, I don't, because um, I see <laughs> that um, I probably would have regretted not trying to see if it was a better parking spot, but now that I see that it's not, I, I'm i going to go and take what I can, and I, and I don't have any regrets. regrets. <laughs> <laughs> I was the type of rapper that was open to rap over anything it didn't matter give me something that you think nobody would rap on and i would listen to it and i'll figure out a way to rap on it which i feel like i feel like that's a gift but then it, it became a curse at one point because i didn't understand early on um once an audience locks into you for a sound <laughs> they they want that more of that sound yeah. Yeah. And I didn't understand that at the time I was still in, I can rap over anything and everything. <laughs> and I was doing that and I was throwing the audience off some early on. And that was my first time realizing whatever you release and whatever that audience gravitate to, you gotta, you gotta be mindful of. If you're trying to sell records. And a brand. <laughs> if you're trying, and well, a brand. It's kind of interesting because yeah. your your musical knowledge and appreciation and the things you know about music is beyond most people I know. And especially for most people in, in rap and hip hop, which they, they most of those guys are kind of like more focused on that style of music. Mm -hmm. You know so much about music, but I, I've often felt like having a wide taste in music mm -hmm. and a love of lots of music can almost be like a hindrance and a curse. Mm -hmm. Because I've had that happen with my career too, where mm -hmm. I just wanted to go work on other music, and within the industry, I, they expected me to stick with yeah, one thing. Yeah, exactly. But I like doing it. I like, but that's what you love. <laughs> but I like I like this sound, and I like that sound, and I like. Well, now, well, speaking well, of that, me in, you man. know what's interesting is like, you know, when we first worked together, I was playing bass on some stuff and all that. But pretty yeah, hold on, and, and oh, if, go ahead. if I'm constantly removing my shirt because I feel like my the shirt. I don't know what the hell. <laughs> I feel like it need to be off of me a little bit, and it seems like it's on me. So I, I'm fighting with my shirt right now. Man. <laughs> I've probably been fighting with it the whole time. So whoever watching it, I just wanted to make the disclaimer. If you see me fighting with my shirt, yes, I am. When we started working together pretty quickly, you wanted to bring a lot of musicians mm -hmm. into it. And then often you're doing gigs at your shows with a band, you mm -hmm. love working with live musicians, mm -hmm. and you've worked with the North Mississippi All Stars. You've worked with, um, I mean, a lot of guys are like, so you know, played with legendary soul musicians, great studio musicians. Like, 
you worked with Skip Pitts. I mean, I'm, I, there's like a, this list of like kind of legendary musicians. Carter Beaufort, man, come on. We That's was in the right. studio we work, we, Dave um, Matthews Band's drummer, man. That was that was very cool. Why do you like working with musicians? It goes back to my love for soul music and you know rock music. I couldn't get the keyboard sounds that both that was supposed to emulate those sounds. It sounded fake to me <laughs> at the end of the day. Like a, a, a rock guitar on a keyboard. Yeah. It didn't, uh, it wasn't the, it wasn't the real thing. And I wanted the real thing. I wanted to really get the real sound. When you have a live person playing it, that personality comes out in it. It's, it's more free. I think it's also the chance of something unexpected happening. Yep. Yep. I think you capture the spirit of that, that player is they're giving you their spirit at that moment. It's unique one time events that'll never happen again. Yep. And that's what I always tell people like you're getting something that, you know, you can get nice keyboards out there that make great sounds, but everybody's got that sound. Mm, that but when too. you put live good live musicians on it, it's it's literally the one time in the universe that happened. You can never repeat it. It could be the same guitar player. Yeah. But 10 minutes later, the strings are going to sound a little different. The humidity in the room changes it. His vibe, how fast, just a million All factors. Of it. All of it. These are unique events. And my whole thing is about being unique. Mm -hmm. And I just, I think a lot of people just do it without thinking about it. But I think a lot of younger people don't even know that what that is, you, you know? I've well, done a couple sessions lately where the person's like, I've never actually been in the room with a guitarist. <laughs> uh, being a rapper with a band just was not the thing to do. It was almost, you know, you know you were going you were really going against the grain when you did when you did that. And I knew that I was already known as an underground rapper and no underground rapper would dare do that. Having a band, I was like, this what needs to be done. Yeah. I'm from Memphis. So I'm like, our hip hop scene is not representing our music uh, legacy. We get we got a legacy in Memphis. And I felt like, other than sampling uh, an old school song and and looping it, we still we wasn't embracing the live music uh, uh, scene that we had. And I just thought that was an opportunity to wanting to be different, wanting to represent Memphis in a, uh, outside of just the underground sound. Uh, and I knew rap was like the dominant, you know, uh, uh, genre of music. And I felt like that's our live legacy was just being looked at as, uh, you know, basically it was, it was a legacy, it was old, and it's like, we gotta bring that sound to, you know, we it's up to us to reintroduce this, what we had, because people forget, there's a lot of people forget, and I wanted to be a part of it. Working with the North Mississippi All-Stars is like an unlikely pair. You know what I'm yeah. saying? <laughs> There's an unlikely pair of North Mississippi All-Stars uh, working with a rapper named Al Capone. Uh, I remember going in the studio with them for the first time, and they were playing me their records. And I could have easily been like, "This, I can't rap over this stuff. You know what I'm saying? This is so left from my... But again, I I got such a, this, this huge open mind for music and, and I can rap over anything. But on top of that, I, I really respected the music. So uh, we were able to go in there and start recording music together and uh, formed a bond and relationship and been able to do shows together. The drummer, Cody, mm -hmm. you had him come in on something we worked on and he was just amazing to work with. But what, what I thought was interesting with him is we got partway into the song and he goes, Oh, this song needs washboard. Yeah. And it's the only time yeah. in my whole life I recorded a washboard. How long? Did you tell him what a washboard is? A washboard is, you know, how the back before washing machines. Yes. People would like wash their clothes on this thing that had uh, wood sides and this corrugated metal, and you'd rub your clothes on it to wash it. But people would use them as instruments, they would hang them on their chest. And then, and I didn't realize this. I'd seen it, but never occurred to me. But when Cody said, "Hey, let's put washboard on this," he actually <laughs> had his own washboard. I'm like, "This guy's got his own washboard." <laughs> I, th I think he might have even had pickups on it or something. But I know he had like what do you call it, thimbles or for sewing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that you the metal things you yep. put on your thumb or fingers. Yep.
So he actually sat up a washboard and put these things on his fingers and rubbed it. But it's the only time in my life, it's, it's actually the only time since then, too, uh, that I've ever recorded a washboard, and it was pretty cool. Wow. But it was like, I was working with these guys, North Mississippi All-Stars. How does that make any sense? But then when y'all were hanging out and the vibe that you guys had was so amazing, I was like, well, that's pretty cool. And then, and then there was another time. This is not a Memphis story, but you're in Atlanta, and I'd already worked with Little John, but I hadn't worked with him in a while because I was off doing other things. But you were in Atlanta, and you were working at some studio. I, I did some co-writing on, yeah. on Snappy Fingers, and uh, yeah, that was amazing times. Little John was like the hugest artist, hip-hop artist in the world, you now, know, and producer. I don't know if you remember this, but that studio, Little John had a room, and he was just working on beats. Mm -hmm. And he had a PA system in there, and it was so fucking yep. loud. Yep. And you and I wanted to talk. We'd not seen each other for a while. So we went in this back room, right, to try to get, and it was like as far as away as we could get from Little John so we could talk, but it was still so loud. And as we were talking, there was literally dust falling from the ceiling as we were talking. I'm like, holy, like the whole building was vibrating. So we talked for a while, but I was like, okay, I, 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 I got to go. You know, I kind of hung out for a while, and then I said goodbye. But Little John yeah. was just cranking it in there. But yeah. you did a bunch of work with him. Yeah, yeah. But what what was working with Little John like? Man, uh, he knows his sound. He understood his style. I saw that he was the type of artist that was open to work with anybody. So by the time I started working with him, uh, actually through E-40, he was the same way. He was uh, open to hear ideas, vibes. He didn't let how he wanted it to go get in the way of if he heard something that made sense that was probably better than what he was thinking. That was my experience, too. Yeah. He, like, he, like he didn't let his ego get in the way. Exactly. It's like if he heard something that made that song that was going to make the song greater, and you somebody said it that wasn't technically supposed to be, man, hey, that's got to go in there. It's got to go in there, you know? And I, and I did that on a few songs. I was just in the studio just vibing out here, him playing a beat or whatever, and then I might just start, you know, do, uh, saying a repetitive line or whatever the case may be. He'll say, you got to go record that. N wasn't planned. It just, he heard it. It felt yeah. right to him. And uh, He's got an interesting mixture of, like, spontaneity but hard work. Yep. Yeah. Like yeah. he'll, oh, he'll work. Yeah. Boy, he'll work. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You, you li you're living in the studio. Just oh, be, yeah. Be prepared to live in the studio. <laughs> I thought I knew what hard work was up until I started working with Little John. And then I was like, eh. Yeah. And and, and sometimes he in several studios. Yeah. Uh, if, it's, if it's a, you know, facility that got different rooms. Well, thanks for watching. I had intended to do a part four of this because he spent some time talking about the history of Memphis and specifically the music of Memphis. But I realize there's so much more to that story. I think I'm going to film some additional footage and maybe even go up there and interview some more people and make it a whole video on its own. So just make sure to check back on that. In the meantime, remember, be unique. <laughs>